Je mi velkou ctí, že nyní mohu uvést a na pódium pozvat další osobnost, která přijala podpořit letošní festival Jeden svět. Jde o editora prestižního týdeníku The Economist, novináře, který se specializuje na politiku, ekonomiku, bezpečnost a také špionážní kauzy východní Evropy, především pak Ruska, a také autora knih Nová studená válka či Podvod. Dámy a pánové, prosím, přivítejme pana Edvoda Lukase. A, a jelikož jsou lidská práva a především také lidské životy v sásce právě nyní v těchto dnech, v těchto chvílích nedaleko našich východních hranic, tak prosím pana Lukase, aby se s námi podělil o svůj pohled na aktuální situaci nejenom na Ukrajině. Děkujeme. Dobrý večer, dámy a pánové. Um, I used to live here and I used to speak Czech, but these days when I try to speak Czech, it comes out in Russian. So if you'll forgive me, I'll speak English. Um, I was a correspondent here in um, 1989. I arrived in January when Václav Havel was in prison and when I left to go off to see the collapse of the Soviet Union, he was president. And in that time, one of the Czech phrases that most annoyed me was this one, Nismi Mali Narod. And it always used to get, get on my nerves somehow. And um, of course, it, you're an even smaller country now because it's, it's split into two. But I think events like this are the antithesis of that feeling of passivity and powerlessness which this we are a small country um, represented. I think it's fantastic that the human rights tradition um, exemplified by Václav Havel and his colleagues carries on 25 years later, and I wish that other European countries showed the same energy and attention to human rights near and far away that we see, that we see here in, in Prague. These are really bad times, and the news is going so fast that I'm finding it difficult even as a journalist to keep up with it. I make one phone call, and by the time I um, finish it, there are 16 or 17 new alarming developments on my, on my Twitter feed. I think the way, and, and this is worse, it is far worse than anything that I've seen um, really in, in, in my lifetime as a journalist. I think it's worse than the Georgian war. It's potentially worse than the Yugoslav war. Um, it's a, 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 the most serious security and geopolitical um, crisis that we faced in Europe probably since the invasion of your country in 1968. The site of a, of a, of a sovereign country being dismembered um, by a larger neighbor and with the world so far more or less looking on. So I thought the way to look at this would be to look at myths and realities. Look at the myths that the Kremlin has, the myths that we in the West have, and then contrast those with the realities and see if we can draw some conclusions. I start off every morning, and I listen to Russian radio first thing in the morning on the internet, and then I try and imagine that I'm Vladimir Putin and I spend a few minutes while I'm cleaning my teeth and shaving, just imagining I was Putin and trying to think myself into his worldview um, with all the paranoia and bombast and nostalgia and resentment that it has to try and work out what he's doing and why he's doing it. And I think it's a, a good way of understanding Putin is to believe, is to understand that he probably believes his own propaganda. He believes his own myths. And this is perhaps something that Western diplomats and Western policymakers find quite hard to understand. So let's look at some of those myths, some of those components of the Putin worldview. I think the most important of those is the feeling that the post-1991 settlement in Europe is profoundly unfair. We look at 1989 to 91 as a liberation. I remember the great poster you had during the revolution which said, Spiet do Europe, back to Europe. And a picture of a ladder climbing up a cliff back into the European continent. And that's true from Tallinn right through to Sofia and to, to Chisinau and to Kiev and to, to Pisces, that 1991 was a liberation. It should be true for Russians too. Russians demonstrated in Red Square on your behalf in 1981. And those same Russians and many others cheered when you um, won your freedom. And they hoped that 1991 would mean their freedom too. That's not the way that Putin sees it. He sees 1991 as a geopolitical catastrophe. 
He said that, the geopolitical catastrophe of the century. He sees it as a humiliation, and a humiliation that was compounded by deceit. He believes, I think wrongly, that the West promised that NATO would never expand, and NATO expanded, as he would put it, right up to Russia's doorstep. Now, we may say that's nonsense. Russia was, NATO was already on the Soviet Union's doorstep. You had a NATO-Soviet frontier in Norway. You had a NATO-Soviet frontier in Turkey. This is nothing new. And anyway, NATO is not designed to attack Russia. But that's not the way he sees it. Another important component of his view is that all this talk about human rights is completely bogus. He thinks that human rights and democracy and media freedom and the rule of law is just an enormous muscular Africa. It's just something that we have come up with in the West, maybe to, to confuse and to deceive our own populations, to make ourselves look good in the world. But in the end, there's no real difference between the way the West does things and the way that Russia does things. Again, it's not true. There's a very simple test. When we have elections in the West, we don't know who's going to win them. When you have elections in Russia, you do know who's going to win them. That contestability is a very simple and fundamental test. But he thinks all this talk of human rights is basically bogus. And when we talk about human rights in the former Soviet Union, he doesn't hear human rights. He thinks provocation, subversion, color, revolution, color revolutions, CIA, and all the rest of it. And two final elements of the Putin mythical worldview are actually contradictory, although he believes them both and very strongly. The first of them is that the West is a threat. He believes the West is out to get to undermine his regime, to undermine the way Russia interacts with its neighbors, to disrupt Russia's alliances, to spread this so-called democracy, or as he would see it, chaos, all over the place. He sees a kind of line that leads from Kosovo to Baghdad to Libya, via Georgia and Bishkek and all the other places that we've had color revolutions and regime change. And he thinks that's part of a narrative that ends up with crowds outside the Kremlin trying to get rid of him, crowds paid for by the West. So he really believes that the West is a threat. And yet at the same time, he also believes the West is very weak. He believes the West is divided. It doesn't stand up to him. He can get away with stuff and we don't do anything. He saw that very clearly during after the Budapest, the Bucharest summit of 2008. He saw it even more clearly after the invasion of Georgia in 2008. So he both believes the West is a threat, but also that he can um, outwit the West, that he can play divide and rule. And for many years, he was, that wasn't completely fanciful. He was able to do things with his friend Gerhard Schroeder, with his friends in France, and Italy, Berlusconi, and other countries. And he was able to put money into Western political systems to buy influence and to do stuff. But we have our own myths as well. I think the biggest one, which I've been fighting um, for 20 years now, is that post-Soviet Russia is not a threat. This is so deeply rooted in the Western official mind view, it's really, really hard to shake. And ever since the Soviet Union collapsed, people have been raising glasses and saying this is fantastic, Russia will never again, again be a threat. Maybe we don't need NATO. Maybe we don't need um, to worry about this stuff. Maybe Russia is um, not completely friendly, but let's not provoke Russia by pretending that it might be a threat. And it was that thinking, for example, which meant that NATO did not draw up contingency plans to defend its new, neighbor, its new, new members in 2004. You were allowed to join, but NATO said, because Russia is not a threat, we are not going to draw up any contingency plans to defend, to defend you, because if we did draw up those plans, Russia would be very annoyed. And that, to me, was a bit like saying a neighbour saying, I'm not going to burglar your house, but if you put a burglar alarm on your house, I'll get very, very upset. There was a certain paradox there, but that was one of the myths. Going along with that myth was the idea that if you were critical of the Russian regime, um, you were Russophobe. You're an old cold warrior. Only only crazy people believe this sort of stuff. Crazy people from Eastern Europe, so-called Eastern Europe, Czechs and Poles and Balts and Slovaks and Hungarians, and people who haven't got over their traumatic experiences behind the Iron Curtain. But this is really a kind of a juvenile attitude or something they'll grow out of. And real people, serious people, realize that Russia is just another country. We can do business with Russia. And that goes on to the next myth, which is that money doesn't smell, as the 
the ancient Romans used to say, pecunia non onet. And that was a huge myth. That allowed us to let Russia, Russian money into our financial systems, um, into our banks. We did all sorts of deals, shamefully in the case of my country, where we allowed the Rosneft company, which was based on the corpse, it had feasted on the corpse of Yukon, so Mr. Mikhail Radikovsky's company, in which $8 billion of Western shareholders' money had gone down the tubes when UCOS was expropriated. And we allowed that company, Rosneft, to list on the London Stock Exchange, and then our most important company, BP, did a deal with it, and I renamed BP Britneft officially after that. So that was another Western myth. And now we get on to reality. Reality is really simple. Reality is the Maidan. Reality is Kathy Ashton, who I doubt has ever had a round of applause in her life that went on for more than 30 seconds, going to Maidan and hearing tens of thousands of demonstrators chanting Ashton, Ashton, Ashton. The enthusiasm that the, the Ukrainian protesters on Maidan showed for Europe was shame. They believed in our values more than we believed in them ourselves. They believed They could see very clearly that Europe, for all its faults, for all its weaknesses, for all its imperfections, for all its inadequacies, Europe offers dignity, it offers decency, it offers legality, it offers liberty, it offers justice in a way that the corrupt, incompetent, authoritarian regime of Viktor Yanukovych did not, not offer. And I hope that that is a real wake-up call. A real wake-up call um, for, for Europe. I think it really jolted European opinion. I have to say this is a sad anecdote about my own poor, beleaguered and benighted country, that I was writing a piece about this for one of our popular newspapers, and I was enthusing about the protesters on Maidan, and I got a message back saying, the editor isn't very happy with the idea that these are pro-European protesters. Can't you say that they're bitterly disappointed with Europe instead? And I said, no, I think the fact that they are waving EU flags and chanting in support of every visiting European dignitary means they're not bitterly disappointed. They may be in future, but they're not, they not now. So that was another thing. Now that, was, that, that is the reality, um, that people really believe this stuff, and maybe we should too. The second um, point I want to make is, what do we do now? And here we get back to myth again. The myth is, there's nothing we can do. As James Baker said about Ukraine, we don't have a dog in this fight. Well, we may not have a dog in this fight, but this fight is coming to us. If we allow this to go ahead and allow the dismemberment, the forcible dismemberment of a neighboring country, doing nothing to stop it without diplomatic sanction, without military response, without any kind of economic response, then it will happen again and it will happen closer. It worries me very much that <coughs> we are sending a signal to Mr. Putin by our inaction that we don't take security seriously. And the big fear I have is that he will then think that he can try the same thing in the Baltic states. And if he tries that, then we will be forced to defend the Baltic states. We are right to defend the Baltic states. We will have to do it by military means. And that's a really terrifying prospect. So I think the first thing we have to do now in these extremely grave times is the clock is ticking towards the 3 a.m. deadline by which the Ukrainian troops in Crimea, one of the commanders of whom is, is a family friend of mine, these Ukrainian troops being told either surrender or we start shooting. We need to reinforce what we now have to call the frontline states of Europe. And that's something we, have, we, do, we, should do, we should do immediately. But there are other things we can do as well. Visa sanctions. I've been campaigning for years to have an easier visa regime for the peoples of um, countries around about Europe. I think it's the most powerful thing we can do is allow people to come here and work and study and trade and shop and save and do all these, all these other things. But when it comes to the people responsible for the attack on Ukraine, it should be the other way around. And I think we should be saying that every single Duma deputy who voted for this, every member of the Federation Council, anyone who works in the Defence Ministry, anyone who works for the Interior Ministry, anyone who works in the Prosecutor's Office, anyone who works the G the, for the FSB, for the SVR, for the GRU, for all these parliaments, you can't come to Europe anymore. You can't come to America anymore. You can't go to anywhere in the civilized world anymore. And guess what? 
your family can't come either. Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, has a daughter who's studying at the London School of Economics, my alma mater. I'd quite like to see the conversation at home in the Lavrov household when she says, Dad, I have to go to Mgimon now because I can't study at LSE just because of this stupid thing you've done in Ukraine. <coughs> we do that 10,000 times over with all the wives and the children and the mistresses and everybody else, and maybe we'll have an impact. The second thing I think we can do is asset freezes. We have allowed tens of billions of dollars of stolen property to be laundered in our countries, in the city of London, in New York, in Vienna, in France, in Carnivivari. How did these people on their modest official salaries buy these multi-million pound houses and make these enormous investments? We should be investigating that, and while we investigate it, let's freeze the assets. And let's also look at the lawyers and the accountants and the bankers who handle those, <coughs> excuse me, handle those transactions and ask if we can uh, maybe introduce them to the joys of the criminal justice system. Raise the bar a little bit. And then finally, I think we have to <coughs> accentuate our soft power. This is what the Maidan understands already. We don't understand it enough. Our system works better. We actually care about human rights. We make them work. And we need to say to the Russians, we are not against you. We are not against Russia. We are against your regime. We want you to enjoy the same things that we enjoy. We want the Ukrainians to enjoy them too. We want you to be Europeans. We want you to have all the rights and privileges and joys and the responsibilities of being part of the modern world. And it's only your leaders who are keeping it back. Thank you.